Coming up on Market to Market, Congress closes a loophole in the new tax code. What do you guys got? And uh, battle plans are made to help those in the fight against opioid addiction. Be stronger. Those stories and market analysis with Brian Roach, next. Wherever your operation takes you, or who you share it with, we'll be where we've been all along. With you, from the word go. Proud sponsor of Market to Market. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today. This is the Friday, March 16 edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Delaney Howell. If the higher prices at the store or the car lot made you hesitate to make a purchase, you weren't alone. More than one consumer held on to their hard-earned cash last month, and economic indexes reflect it. Retail sales fell one-tenth of a percent in February as the purchase of cars, gasoline, and trips to restaurants for an evening out declined. Core retail sales, which excludes those purchases, actually rose one-tenth of a percent. The Consumer Price Index, a measure of inflation, grew two-tenths of a percent last month as rural Americans paid a little more for clothing and car insurance. Even without more volatile food and energy factors, core CPI moved up two-tenths of a percent. Seed giant Syngenta has reached a $1.5 billion settlement with farmers and others who are suing the agricultural giant. The case centered on delayed export approvals of two corn varieties. If approved by a federal judge, it will be the largest settlement in the history of agricultural lawsuits. Farmers also held another legal victory this week when the federal government made a fix to the new tax law. Peter Tubbs has the details. Congressional leaders announced a fix to a tax loophole that had been causing heartburn for America's farmers planning their grain marketing. The tax reform bill signed by President Donald Trump in December 2017 included a provision giving row crop farmers a 20 percent tax deduction on grain sold to cooperatives. The rule put private grain handling businesses, like elevators and ethanol plants, at a competitive disadvantage. An unintended consequence of the new law caused disparate treatment among independent operators and cooperatives in the same industry. Federal tax policy should not be picking winners and losers in the marketplace. The new rule is expected to be retroactive to January 1st of 2018 and would restore the workings of Section 199A to its previous structure. Farmers would no longer be able to deduct 20% of their income from cooperatives, but may be able to exercise up to a 20% deduction of their gross income, depending on their circumstances. A joint statement from the Senate Finance Committee acknowledged the loophole in the original bill and celebrated the efforts taken to close it. We've worked extensively with stakeholders, our colleagues, and the administration to develop a solution that will level the playing field and ensure the nation's cooperatives, independent small businesses, and publicly traded firms can fairly benefit from pro-growth tax reform. The National Council of Farmer Cooperatives and National Grain and Feed Association issued a joint statement in favor of the adjustments. The groups hope to find the tax benefits under the previous version of Section 199 before the 2017 Tax Act. We believe the solution merits enactment so that competitive choices remain available to agricultural producers and the marketplace, not the tax code, determines with whom they do business. The National Farmers Union is against amending the current rules in a way that would reduce the tax benefit for farmers. The group argues that farmers who don't hire outside labor would be penalized when selling grain to a cooperative. To repeal parts of this important tax break would be a strike at the single most important benefit family farmers received from tax reform. Not only would corporations be better off, but farmers would be disadvantaged by working with their cooperatives. The fix likely will be included in the omnibus spending bill scheduled for a vote on March 23rd. For Mark to Market, I'm Peter Tubbs. Drug addiction is generally branded as a problem that only affects those in urban settings. However, the problem has crept into rural America. 
New chemical compounds have helped in the treatment of chronic pain and assisted many recovering from injuries, but some are unable to resist continued use and become addicted. The problem knows no income level, political stripe, or ethnic background. It kills 91 people every day. Its abuse has shattered families and ways of life. This week, USDA ramped up its battle against the problem with a series of roundtable discussions and an infusion of funds. John Torpy has more. What do you guys got? Uh, possible overdose. There's some stuff sitting on the table there. Can, can you wake up for me? Last year, we lost over 64,000 people in America. That's more fatalities than the average number of servicemen lost during World War II. So if somebody does not want to call this a war, I don't know where you get 64,000 Americans dying from heroin and opioid overdoses. Not ever be a problem. Over two decades ago, painkillers derived from synthetic morphine were seen as a miracle drug for patients coping with chronic pain. Since then, numerous forms of synthesized narcotics have made their way into doctor's offices and pharmacies. According to the Centers for Disease Control, as the number of opioids increased, so did addiction rates. The Trump administration has declared the problem a public health emergency. A CDC study released this month reports a 70 percent increase in opioid overdoses in the Midwest from July of 2016 to September of 2017. For those fighting opioid misuse on the rural front, resources can be scarce. At the USDA, officials are using more than $2 billion in grant and loan programs to help small towns enhance their abilities when responding to the opioid epidemic. In 2015, the CDC reported over 33,000 deaths nationwide related to opioid overdose. Over the past two years, that number has more than doubled. As rural leaders, it is important to understand the nature of this issue, the impact that it is having on small towns across our country, from Michigan to Montana, and the role that we can play as leaders in the solution at that grassroots community level. Man. Wake up for me, dear. Pressure's down to 124. Those developing the strategies to fight opioid misuse are fighting a war on two fronts. One is availability. Officials with the Iowa Governor's Office of Drug Control Policy are concerned medicines like Percocet, Oxycontin, and other fentanyls have a safer persona that elicit drugs. Komandowski believes that safer persona creates a climate for addiction. The other front is the amount. Federal government officials contend, with a perception of low risk, opioids have been prescribed in ample amounts with little concern for misuse. Making physicians aware of how many pills are being written into prescriptions is one way opioid misuse is being confronted. Previously, you'd see a prescription come in maybe for 60 tablets. Uh, now we're seeing more prescriptions written for 30. As a licensed pharmacist, Bring, bring that with you, though. Okay. And legislator in the Iowa House of Representatives, John Forbes uses his unique position to help craft legislation aimed at helping curb opioid misuse in rural Iowa. But Forbes knows he and his colleagues on the other side of the pharmacy counter are on the front lines of fighting the epidemic. Pharmacists just need to be vigilant whenever they have a prescription presented to them that they have questions about. A tool pharmacists use when a suspicious prescription comes to their attention is the Prescription Drug Monitoring Program. Established in the 1930s to track Schedule II narcotics, the program has evolved to an electronic database stretching coast to coast. We check that database on new prescriptions, especially patients that are new to our pharmacy, to make sure they're not doctor shopping or uh, going to multiple pharmacies to try to obtain uh, controlled substances. Last year, the Drug Enforcement Administration stepped in to help slow the opioid epidemic by allowing pharmacies to partially fill prescriptions. A program like this helps keep larger quantities of opioids out of the system so there's less chance for diversion. Officials see a long fight ahead that will require a balance between limited funding and scarce resources. And when the consequences hit American culture anywhere, low population, rural areas, 
where the density is low, they have the least amount of health care, the least amount of counseling, the least amount of resources for public safety, they're at risk for much longer than where we can apply all the big money and resources. For Market to Market, I'm John Torpy. Next, the Market to Market Report. The commodity markets chewed on news of poor crop condition in South America until it lost its flavor. An attempt to replace the news with early private acreage estimates was largely ignored. For the week, May wheat fell 21 cents and the nearby corn contract fell 8 cents despite the highest export sales in 23 years. A combination of an escalating drought in Argentina, better than expected export sales and strong crush numbers pushed the May soybean contract a dime higher. Meal, which has led the way since January, barely kept the pace, losing 70 cents per ton. May cotton shrank 167 per hundredweight. Over in the dairy parlor, April Class 3 milk futures gained 29 cents. The April livestock sector fell back as the April live cattle contract lost $1.88. Nearby feeders shed $2.95, and the April lean hog contract fell $2.40. The U.S. dollar index moved 16 ticks higher. April crude oil climbed 49 cents per barrel. Comex Gold cut 11.70 cent per cents per ounce, and the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index was relatively flat, closing at 4.44.30. Here now to lend us his insights on these and other trends is one of our regular market analysts, Brian Roach. In case you want to go over things again, you can download or listen to our market analysis and Market Plus podcasts online anytime at iptv.org slash mtom. Brian Roach, welcome back to the desk. Thanks for having me. Brian, let's start here with the wheat markets. We've been holding generally close to the trend channel, but we pulled back pretty significantly here at the end of the week. Are the highs in for wheat? Could could be. Um, you know, we thought uh, selling July Kansas City wheat, uh, you know, a couple months ago looked like a good sale. We had a chance to step up those sales uh, at the 560 level on Kansas City, and that's all been driven by weather. And, you know, once you trade, the, the charts really do a good job and a very efficient job of trading the weather. And I think that's really what we're seeing is that the five to seven day forecast in the southern plains that have been dry, you know, uh, crop ratings in, in the Kansas City or Kansas mm -hmm. uh, uh, state ratings are like 52 percent poor to very poor. Oklahoma, 70, over 70 percent poor, very poor. But that's already reflected in the charts. And now we have a little bit of rain potentially coming in, continues to move south. And I think the market's just taken, uh, you know, taking those new longs. The specs are taking those new longs off the table. If we do get some rain in those parts that really need it the most, will we see a little more upside? Um, hard, to, hard, to, hard to say. Okay. I'd say for the first half of the year, these could be the highs that we get until we see what kind of uh, crop comes out of dormancy, how much rain we really get. Uh, but I, I would say these could be the, one of the better prices of the year, uh, at least until we get into really getting a better look at what kind of wheat we're going to have. And mm -hmm. will the rains continue? I think that'll probably dictate what we have here. We closed, closed down below the 20-day moving average in wheat, not typically a good sign. So I think we might see some tough wheat markets next week. Okay. Let's transition into corn. South American weather is still a big story here in the corn markets as well. And the thing I want to start out with here is there's a huge discrepancy between CONAB and USDA for planted acreage. Are USDA's numbers still too high for Brazil corn? Uh, hard, hard to say. It's really those, those numbers don't typically come out until uh, future reports. I think it'll still be a pretty good crop no matter what. And really Brazil, the, I, you know, we're going to have a good crop on the second corn crop down there. It's really Argentina that's driving today's corn market. We've had a, you know, we're down to a 47 million ton mm -hmm. crop according to the USDA. Their own government came out with a 40 million ton number this week. And I guess week. that was my next question. Are, are we still too high for USDA when you look at like the Rosario Grain Exchange? Well, uh, so they have a habit of being the low bar on okay. the estimates, and so when you, you know, when you put those numbers together, I think the trade already has an idea that the crop's going to probably get smaller, even from last week's USDA report. We know that, but we also have built in the idea that we're going to see a lot of those exports. Last week's report 
put a lot of those smaller export numbers out of Argentina over into the U.S. camp. Mm -hmm. And so now we need to continue to see the U.S. export numbers remain strong. We are seeing that. Yeah. I think that's an outperform line item in the, in the balance sheet for the, for the year. But we still have been willing to get some sales on. We've made a round or two of corn sales out of the bin. And I think getting a little bit started for new crop makes sense at these kind of prices. And we have had really strong export sales. This was the largest week in 23 years. Can we logistically keep up to what the USDA has projected for us? I don't see why we wouldn't. I mean, I think the U.S. is probably one of the only countries that could keep up with mm -hmm. these types of pace, these levels. And we might be front-loading it a little bit. Uh, just anticipation of what could happen in the, uh, you know, these price levels are uh, way up off of where we were. Um, you know, we, do we have more to go? I, I'm not so sure. But the market's doing a pretty good job of pricing in all of this higher demand level. I think most of the corn demand line items will probably outperform this year. And I think that leaves us some really good, I think I'm excited to see corn where it's at. I think you know, we, we deserve a correction. But okay. looking at the COT reports today, since the third week of January, all crops, oil seeds, meal, et cetera, the specs have bought back a million contracts. Mm -hmm. So we've seen a net change in ownership of a million from the lows to uh, this week's report that's as of Tuesday. And so when the specs make that type of, uh, when, they, when the transaction looks that large over that, that three, or three month period or so, we've seen prices all re respond to that. It's given us an excellent selling opportunity. And now it'll be a matter of, do the specs want to continue to buy longs or is it time for some sort of a correction? Mm -hmm. Do we get rain in Argentina? It looks like we might get a little bit of rain and that'll kind of like stop the bleeding, but that crop is in really, really bad shape. And now it'll be a matter of, uh, I think we're going to move on into the U.S. growing season more and more. We've got big reports at the end of the month on mm -hmm. acreage. And, uh, you know, where, where bean prices sit today, I think we, we, it stands, stands to say that bean acres will probably hunt really well. But I like cotton, too. And I think the extra acres in cotton the USDA put out, like 13 million acres, that could be maybe that might, if that's a little bit small, then that comes from corn. Okay. Mid-South farmers are looking at corn, soybeans, and wheat, and right, or corn, soybeans, and cotton, rather. And cotton looks good in a lot of those states. So I think cotton is a, uh, a friend to corn and certainly some, somewhat to beans uh, as we head into spring. Okay, well, you already took care of my acreage estimates question, so let's move on to soybeans, Brian. Are global end users getting nervous about South American soybean availability? Uh, I think if I'm a Chinese buyer, I'm trying to keep my, uh, both of my supply chains balanced. And so um, uh, now we've got these trade concerns about, you know, well, China does not want a trade war on, mm -hmm. on ag. And so, uh, if, but I would expect that those channels will stay relatively balanced. And typically we lose to Brazil in this period here as they come out of harvest. And I think that we should expect that. Uh, they're going to make up for some but not all of the Argentine cuts in, in soybeans. Um, so uh, I, think it'll, I think we're in good shape. We've seen quite a, we saw, well, over the last couple of trading sessions here, we had two down days and then we finished the week out relatively strong. Is there a trend changing in soybeans? Well, potentially, potentially. And that really comes from the availability of beans out of Brazil. Uh, it's also an old story in Argentina. We mm -hmm. already know that. Uh, typically, we, we, what we haven't seen in Argentina yet is a big swing in meal business to the U.S. So meal business in the U.S. is up, say, 1.5 million tons over last year. Uh, world demand for meal is up 11 million tons over last year. So, but we're not seeing a lot of that meal business come to the U.S., which typically on a shrinking crop in Argentina where meal is such a big, big supply to the world, uh, we haven't seen that yet. And so uh, um, uh, part of that comes from, from last year's crop. They're carrying more than they did last year. Um, and so that'll keep those meal crush plants moving. But at the end of the day, Brazil's coming off. The harvest is going to move. Mm -hmm. They've got lots of infrastructure they've added to their ports. I don't see that being, maybe they delay, have some, some delays, but I wouldn't see that being a market uh, deal today. Okay. Really quick, let's touch on cotton because we don't often get to that in the main program. Trade has been starting to wane over the last couple of weeks after the bullish S&D report. Is that what you're seeing is we're going to have some further downside risk here? 
could. Uh, new crop uh, cotton trading, 78, 79 this mm -hmm. week. Strong prices. Farmers are telling us. We're at the Commodity Classic. Talked to a lot of Mid-South farmers who see cotton uh, stronger than last year f for sure. Uh, certainly economics of cotton makes some sense. And the USDA has put in some uh, disaster insurance right. protection this year. So um, I, I think that this is a good spot to make make sure if you're adding acres in cotton, you get something put in place, okay. whether forward contracting, probably mm -hmm. the most, most likely uh, way to do that. Uh, and then the weather will dictate the final acreage. And so we can sit here and estimate all, that all we want, uh, but the weather will really dictate that on into spring. Okay. Let's move on here to the meat markets. We've seen a lot of oversold conditions in both the cattle and the hog markets. When we look at cattle specifically, do you think the near-term lows are in for live cattle? Uh, could be. Uh, the, the story in, in, in the fats is, is low volumes, tight supplies. Uh, these pastures have drawn, you know, filled the feedlots. Mm -hmm. And so now, now it's a matter of how are the packers going to see that into the next three or four weeks. Um, Beef cutout values, though, are the strongest we've seen yeah. for the year, what, 224, 225-ish, mm -hmm. and that could be a high mark for the year. So I think it's a, it's a matter of being patient and looking for perhaps some selling opportunities into June. Uh, I do like the demand picture in beef. The cutout value is just one indication. The export numbers have been very strong. So I think it's, a, uh, it's hard, hard to say if the lows are in because... Uh, um, because of these big numbers in the pin, but we do have a hole, a marketing hole that's opened up that could that could create some upside there. Okay, and with that large supply we're having, we're sitting on here going into the second quarter. Are you concerned about replacement numbers? P potentially, and so it'll be a matter of do we get those pastures greened up? You know, do we get the pastures greened up and give the feeder market a reason, the feeder guy, or the feeder operator a reason to put some cattle out onto the pastures? Mm -hmm. But right now, I think the feeder cattle market could probably be lower uh, before it's higher, just, just on that idea right there, near term. Near term, how much lower are we talking? Uh, if you look at the charts, there's probably a, a tick or two, two or three dollars lower here nearby. Okay. Yep. But long term, ultimately strong? Uh, well, it depends on it. Really, it really depends on the seasonal moves that we okay. normally see. If you if you look at the the patterns here into the summertime, there are going to be some opportunities. But right now, these pastures are creating the pin, the pins are full, and the packers will have some oppor They'll have some distortions to deal with here over the next three or four weeks. We'll first have to take a look at that. Okay, really quick here. Let's finish out with hogs. Are the lows in for hogs as well? Uh, well, uh, I would think so, but uh, if you look at the spec position in the hogs, mm -hmm. there's not much long length left. It's mostly short, so you would, you would think that the futures don't have a whole lot of downside here, so I'd look at that first. Cutout values are back down to the 72, 73, which is a kind of that low that's been holding. Um, we're starting to build a little bit of June length. Right. On, this, on this type of price action, 78, 79, uh, with the idea, last year we saw a pretty good setback in April before we rallied okay. into the seasonal mm -hmm. highs um, last year, but normally we see a seasonal move stronger in the cash all the way into mid-year, so I think you got to be thinking that way. Uh, are the lows in? I, that's really hard to tell, but I would say that we should see some, some move, we may see a correction on into April potential setback April, but then a, a good seasonal move into mid-year. Okay. Brian Roach, thank you so much. Thank you. That wraps up the broadcast portion of Market to Market. You can catch more market discussion in Market Plus, available in podcast and video form on our website. Market to Market may be airing in different time slots due to fundraising on PBS. If you find value in our program, please consider making an investment in a service that provides you with the news and market analysis you've come to know and trust. Join us again next week when we'll examine how NAFTA has failed one sector of the agricultural economy. So until then, thanks for watching. I'm Delaney Howell. Have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa Public Television, which is solely responsible for its content. Wherever your operation takes you, or who you share it with, we'll be where we've been all along.
with you from the word go. Proud sponsor of Market to Market. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today.